session, load them as the three. Do you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Right. Is this good? Uh, so I will begin by telling you what is action value and why we should care about it. Uh, then I will tell you that there is seemingly overwhelming evidence for action value representation in the striatum. Uh, then I will continue to show you that in fact if we take uh, neural data in which there is no action value representation and we do the same analysis that were done in the literature, uh, we can actually get very similar results to the results that are reported in the striatum. Um, and I will show that this in fact happens due to two separate compounds. And finally, I will discuss some alternative approaches. Okay. So let's start from the beginning uh, with operant learning. So basically, an operant learning behavior is modified according to its consequences, and it is often uh, tested in two, ar uh, two armed banded tests. Uh, so just to give an example, uh, this is taken from the uh, same GMI class, 2005. Uh, so in this experiment, uh, there is a monkey, and the monkey has a joystick. And in each trial, you have to hold the joystick in the middle for one second. Uh, and then the monkey gets to choose whether it wants to move the joystick to the right or to the left. Uh, and after the monkey makes a choice, the monkey gets a reward, either a large reward or a small reward. Um, and whether the monkey gets a reward or not is probabilistic, and the probabilities depend on the choices that the monkey makes. Uh, and we have different probability contingencies. Uh, so here, for example, we have five blocks. Uh, so in one block, uh, for example, if the monkey chooses left, it gets a reward 50% of the time, a large reward. And if it chooses right, it gets a large reward that's only 10% of the time. And we have here five different blocks in which it is expected that the monkey will learn to choose uh, and prefer the more rewarding action. And this is an example of, sorry, this is an example <coughs> of a session, an experimental session. Uh, and we can see here that the different reward contingencies are organized throughout the session in different blocks so that the monkey can learn the reward contingencies in each block. And the monkey, uh, in here you can see the probability of choice and the choices, and a long line means that the monkey got a large reward, and a short line means that the monkey got uh, a small reward. And we can see that the monkey actually learned to prefer the more rewarding option uh, in each block. So for 50, 10, the monkey preferred to go left, and then for 10, 50, the monkey preferred to go right, uh, and, and so forth. And the question here is, is, how does the monkey learn to behave this way? How does the monkey learn to prefer the more rewarding option? Uh, and this question actually has a very popular answer, um, which is uh, that uh, the in decision making, there is calculation of the value of each action. Uh, and when this value is calculated, choice is rated according to uh, the value, the, these action values that are calculated separately for each action. So in this context, action value is the probability of reward. Uh, so if we look here at the session, uh, the action value of action left will be here 50%, 50%, 10%, 90%, and uh, going back to 50%. Uh, and these are uh, the, the action values that it is presumed that the monkey learns. And this is also for the right action, and there are only two actions in this experiment. And we see for the right action 50%, 10%, 50, 50, 90, and back to 50. And the idea is after the monkey learns these two action values, uh, the monkey makes a choice according to the difference between them. Uh, and now there is a lot of literature and people that are trying to show that there is representation uh, in the striatum of these action values. Uh, how is this evidence? How, how do we get this evidence? What are the analyses that are made? Uh, so what is done is that we take the neural activity. Here uh, the neural activity was recorded in each trial uh, in the one second part of the decision. <coughs> so this is just an example of a spike count. Uh, from single, this is an example of a single unit spike count. Uh, throughout uh, an example of an experimental session. Uh, and we take here the action values. Uh, so here in this, uh, in this example session, uh, the action value of going left is 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and you can see also action value of going right. Uh, and we simply take these spike counts and we regress them on the action values. Uh, usually when we use these objective action values, uh, regression is done only for the last few trials in each block because then it is assumed that the monkey has already learned these action values. Okay. So uh, this is the regression model. You can see here 
uh, both action value Q, QL marks action value left and QL marks action value right. Um, and also, a neuron is classified as an action value neuron only if it has significant regression coefficients with one action value but not with the other. Because the whole idea uh, that, defines, that defines action values is that the, the calculation of the value of each action is separate from the values of the other actions. So, so how do you uh, disambiguate this with the Sorry, you're asking how it's, how it's related? No, if you regress it to the actual decision of the animal. The, the action values. No, no, instead of action values, can I explain the spike count dependent on the actual decision rather than ah, the action okay, value? Okay. How do you know it's action value rather than decision? This is a really good question and I'm going to get to it in the second part of my talk. We actually discussed it. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm just presenting here some results. This is an example also from same G minus uh, And these are uh, the T values uh, from the regression and the uh, Q val uh, action value right slope. And these are the T values of the regression uh, here on the Y axis and the action value left slope. Um, so basically, uh, oh, these are all the neurons that had a significant regression coefficient with action value right. And these are all the neurons that had a significant regression coefficient with action value right, but not with action value left. And th these neurons are classified as action value right neurons, 22% of the neurons. These are all the neurons that had a significant regression coefficient with action value left. And these are all the neurons that had a significant regression coefficient with action value left, but not with action value right. And these are action value left neurons, 17%. And in total, 39% of the neurons were classified as action value neurons. Uh, if you notice here, we have two significant steps. So by chance, we will expect around 10% of action value neurons. This is far beyond that. So this is taken as very strong support that there is representation of action value in the striatum. Okay. Uh, now, this is only one way to do this analysis. Uh, but actually, we don't really expect subjects to know these reward probabilities. Subjects learn the reward probabilities through the interaction with the choices and rewards. So what is uh, more, more often done today is that we adopt the point of view of the subject. Uh, so in this regard, how is action value calculated? So the idea is basically that we have action values and they inform our choice. The choice is a function of the difference between the action values. And of course, choosing left is more probable when the difference is larger between uh, uh, action value left and action value right. And then, sorry, okay. And then we get a reward and we ask the data our action values. So for the action that was chosen, the new action value is simply a weighted mean of the old action value and the reward that we got. And the action, the action value of the action that wasn't chosen remains the same. We don't know anything new about it. Okay, and this is a, a model, a one-state skill learning model. Uh, so just to show this in a model. All right. uh, so here we have the reward probabilities. Uh, and here we have a model with uh, learning through action values. Here you see the behavior, the choices, and the rewards. And here you can see the action values. So what we see is that if the beginning of the subject shows uh, chose one and, uh, got, and didn't get a reward, so the action value one would become low, smaller, and then uh, the subject chose two and got a large reward, so action value two would become larger, and so forth. And this also informs the behavior. Uh, and we actually believe that what the subject uh, represents uh, in its mind when it does, the, when it does decision making is much more similar to this than the objective action value. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it is also common, instead of regressing the neural activity on the objective action values, to regress them on the subjective action values. Uh, so using either one of these options, there is quite a lot of literature that reports uh, significant evidence, much about chance uh, fraction of uh, either neurons or uh, ball signal activity in fMRI. This is done in rats, in monkeys, in people. Uh, they report a uh, representation uh, of action value. Uh, which is much larger than we would expect by chance. So it seems basically that there is no, no open question here, right? The, the evidence, I, for me, is overwhelming. Uh, but we wanted to look a little bit deeper uh, into uh, the analysis that were made. And to do this, uh, we wanted to test them on neurons that actually represent action value. Uh, to, to find neurons that we know for sure represent action values, we had to simulate neurons. So we simulated Q learning in the framework of the two-armed bodies experiment, very similar to the, to the experiment done by same gene might uh, And here, these are our simulations. Uh, and we use uh, these action values. So uh, these are the action values that, that uh, we got in our simulations. 
But of course, uh, when uh, people do experimental work, they don't have access to these action values. What they do is they take the history of choices and rewards uh, and they use them to estimate action values. So we also did this and we got something pretty similar. Uh, and then we created simulated action value neurons. These are neurons um, whose firing rate is uh, actually a linear transformation of the action value and then we added Poisson noise for the spike counts. And we regressed the spike counts uh, in 1,000 sessions, 20,000 20, neurons uh, on the estimated action values, uh, and these are the results that we got. Uh, here again, you can see uh, the T values for uh, action value one, action value two. Uh, not all neurons are classified as action value neurons because of the noise, but we can still detect a large fraction uh, of action value neurons that are classified as such. Okay, uh, and now we went ahead and did something uh, that I think uh, people would not usually think to do. We decided to do the same analysis with our simulated action values uh, and unrelated neural activity and see what happens. Of course, if the neural activity has nothing to do with learning or with action values, we don't expect to find anything. Um, so we took unrelated spike counts and we randomly assigned them estimated action values for the regression analysis. Here is one example. Uh, the spike count is taken from the motor cortex during a, a brain machine interface experiment. Uh, and this is just a spike count uh, throughout the trial that we just arbitrarily decided this when we wanted to record. Uh, we, we took this uh, uh, from another lab and they gave us their data uh, from just uh, arbitrary partitions. Um, and we just randomly assigned them uh, action values and we did the same regression that is done in the literature. Uh, and we did this for three data sets in completely unrelated experiments. These are the results that we got. Uh, so first of all, the motor cortex. Here we have uh, 89 neurons during the brain machine interface experiment. And you can see here that the results that we got are that 36% of the neurons represent action value. Again, I repeat, uh, this is a completely different experiment and this is taken from the motor cortex. Okay? And what we expect by chance will be 10% in total. So, so in, in this motor cortex game, I was, there was reward and, or there was nothing? There was so the, the, uh, no, there was the, the task was different. Uh, the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to go uh, to actually so go into the take, task. If you take your uh, striatum data mm -hmm. and you shuffle, you get the same result as this. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. So actually, uh, I will I will skip the little part and I'll talk about the basal ganglia. So we actually took data from uh, this is the, the ventral striatum, which is not usually used in these experiments, um, and we actually uh, took our action values and we used them. Uh, for, for the regression, uh, for the regression on the cycles that are recorded uh, from the basal ganglia, and uh, these are the results that we got. So basically, it doesn't really matter which action values you use, you are still going to get a very large fraction uh, of representation of, uh, of action value, uh, action value neurons. Uh, and also for the auditory cortex, uh, this is in an exercise rest. Uh, intracellular recordings, it's a little bit, uh, results are a little bit lower, but still uh, very much about chance. Okay, so. Yeah, I'm a little confused about this, this other data. Is it just like a bunch of recordings somebody made and, and you just line them up arbitrarily with, with your. Yes, yeah, so we went to labs and we asked them for their data. And they gave, they gave us their data from whichever experiment that they just had, whatever they had currently. And then we just randomly took our action values from a simulation. Uh, we, we superimposed them on the spike counts and we did the regression. And these are the results that we got. Uh, okay, so what is going on here? Actually, there is an explanation. Um, so when you do regression analysis, uh, of course, we all learn there are a few assumptions that we, we uh, have to answer before we can do the analysis. And one of these assumptions is <coughs> independence of trials. Um, now, uh, violating this assumption is always a risk when we do time series because approximate trials may be correlated. But actually, when we deal with action value by construction, we see that there are dependencies between closed trials. This happens both for objective action values. Of course, the action value remains the same for, throughout the block and, and changes uh, actually not very often. But also for the subjective action values, this occurs uh, because uh, by the way we define learning of action value, action value at time t plus one will be some function of action value at time t. Uh, so here we can see that there are dependencies between closed trials. What will happen is that in the case uh, that spike counts also include such dependencies, what we will get is a violation of the independence of trials assumptions, and we will get spurious correlations. 
which means that we get high regression coefficients, which can, which can go, of course, the mean will be zero, but the variance of the regression coefficients that we will get will be much larger than expected by chance. And so we get these high regression coefficients, which pass the significance boundaries uh, without any real connection between the data. Uh, and just to show this, uh, that th this th theoretical point actually makes sense, uh, we did the same analysis using random walk neurons. What do I mean by random walk? So these are neurons here in gray. You can see the firing rate of two example neurons, uh, the gray line. Uh, these are neurons whose firing rate uh, simply follows a random walk process. So the firing rate at time t plus one is the firing rate at time t plus some random variable. Uh, and then the spike counts are uh, simply Poisson distributed around the firing rate. Um, and we also randomly superimposed action values on these uh, random walk neurons. And first of all, you can see in these examples that we can get something that actually looks to the eye like an action value neuron simply by doing random walk. So the, this uh, above neuron looks like it represents the, the, the red action value here. Uh, we can also see the difference between the blocks where the first ac action value one changes, but there is no difference between the last two blocks. And also it actually seems like it follows a pretty similar trend. And also for uh, the neuron here below, we can see a difference between the last two blocks, but not between the first two blocks. Right, but these are all, of course, examples. So we did also a population analysis, and this, on the ran this was done on the random walk neurons. Uh, here you can see the two example neurons uh, in red and in blue. Uh, and we also got uh, a much above chance uh, fraction uh, of neurons that were classified as action value neurons, in this case, 42, uh, 42%. Okay. Why don't you get as many negative ones? Sorry? Why don't you get as many negative regression uh, uh, Right. So, so here we were just uh, trying to get something that is similar to the data, right? And when we do simulations, we can choose uh, whichever way we want to do the linear transformation. So for half of the neurons, we did a negative linear transformation. But the, but you might, so one of the signatures you're, you're seeing that you get is quite, um, mm -hmm. right. uh, Because also the thing is, uh, you are correct that if, uh, if in the original analysis, it was restricted to only, posi only positive action value was considered, so we wouldn't find as many. <coughs> All right. um, so uh, we started thinking about solutions to this issue. I mean, we only tried uh, the, these analyses. Maybe there are other ways which are not uh, as, as prone to the problem as the analysis that we did. I think the first thing that comes to mind is adding blocks, right? We have only four blocks. Uh, it's quite easy for a random walk, random walk neuron to disguise itself as an action value neuron. Turns out, counterintuitively, that using longer sessions with more blocks does not reduce the number of erroneously detected action value neurons. What happens is, because we do a significance test, we want to keep uh, the significance threshold at p equals 0.05 in this case, uh, and so the significance boundary is lowered. So if we have uh, a larger sample size, we need smaller effect size to get significant results. Uh, and we also did the simulations to find this, um, and we see that the uh, random walk neurons, eight blocks, we used the original four blocks uh, twice in random permutations, uh, and we also get a very large fraction of action value neurons. <coughs> so this doesn't work. Um, we also wanted to be rigorous, so we tested a lot of different analyses that we found in the literature to see if anything uh, is not subject to this, uh, to this compound that we found, and I'm not going to go into that, I'm just going to show you all the hard work that we did, um, and, the, and we didn't find anything. Uh, we, we were able to replicate uh, the results in the literature uh, for all the different analyses that we tried, uh, and we also tried them on, on the uh, three different data sets and our simulated random walk neurons. Okay. So what does work? Um, so we suggest a possible solution. First of all, it's important to note uh, that the solution must make no assumptions about the type of dependencies between trials. Uh, so one of the problems of the previous analysis or, or different uh, uh, ways that people try to solve this issue is that it is assumed that the, the, the way that the correlation or the dependency between trials, they take a certain form. So if we assume it's random walk or if we assume it's oscillations or trends and we are wrong, we still may get this erroneous detection. So we wanted to find a solution that does not make this assumption. And this is our suggestion. Uh, for each measured spike count, uh, compare the regression on the action value from the measured session with the regression on action value from other sessions. Um, so what do, what do I mean by this? Uh, let's say I recorded the spike count during an experimental session, and these were the action values that were estimated from this session. If this is an actual action value neuron, I will expect its regression with the action value here to be much larger, uh, the regression coefficient, than uh, the regression coefficient with the action value that I took from another random day. 
Uh, so basically, if the T value for the actual action value is in the top 5%, uh, the analysis result is considered significant. Uh, and this is, of course, something that if the neuron is simply slowly modulating, it wouldn't care which action value I attach to it or I superimpose on it. So, of course, these analyses have lower power than the original analysis, meaning that they will not be able to detect as many action value neurons, but the false positive rate here is reliable. But it might still care a little bit because it depends on whether the trajectory of the action value was somehow correlated or anti-correlated with what this neuron was doing, and uh, so it's not obvious that this test is really resolving all the problems. Yes, uh, yes y y okay, so y you're basically saying my next slide. <laughs> Uh, so we were we were happy for us. How many sessions do we have? Uh, so of course we have as many <laughs> sessions as we want for our simulation. So here we was <coughs> we used 1,000 sessions. Uh, okay. uh, and and for um, here for uh, for our simulated data or for our unrelated data it worked. So the the uh, simulated action value nerves were classified as action value nerves. We found an above chance. The, uh, fraction of action value neurons, but all the other data, this is not surprising, uh, was not detected as representing action value. Um, and we also did this, and here we only had the uh, 50 sessions. We, only, we also did this for the data that we took from the basal ganglia. This is taken from Ito and Doya uh, uh, from 2009. Uh, they reported around 20%. We did a permutation test using the original action values from their analysis, and we were not able to, to detect the action value representation, we got uh, something that is a round chance. Um, so of course, it doesn't, this does not in any way mean that we can say that there isn't action value representation in the stratum, but as far as our analysis go, we did not detect any. Okay, and now I'm getting to, to your question. So we were very happy with this new solution, uh, and we know that it deals with the case of unrelated slow modulations, but what about variables that are related to decision making? So uh, we tested this new solution on neurons that represent choice. Uh, so we took neurons whose firing rate is a linear function of choice. Uh, so for left, they would fire at 2 hertz, and for right, they would fire at 1 hertz. And turns out that these neurons, even using our permutation analysis, will also pass as action value neurons. Okay. Not only do they pass as action value neurons, but we see that the uh, fraction of action value neurons here is larger than the fraction of what we call delta Q or sigma Q. Um, and this is true both for the original analysis and for uh, the permutation test. So uh, while the permutation test deals with cases in which the modulations are completely unrelated to decision making, it does not solve the problem uh, of the, of the um, modulations that are related I in a way that may be um, co-varied with, with the, these action values. Uh, so what is going on here? Um, so I'll take a minute to talk about the relation between choice and action value. Uh, so the law of effect states that behavior that is followed by a rewarding consequence is more likely to be repeated. We also saw this in the experiment by Sam Jim et al. I'm just giving the same uh, uh, paper as an example just because it's easy. So there are also a lot of other papers that show this, uh, of course, but uh, we can see that for the blocks where it's uh, preferable to choose left, which are here the green and blue blocks, uh, and w the animal will get a reward more frequently, then the monkey learns to prefer to go left. And in the blocks where it's more preferable, where uh, the monkey will get more reward if it will go right, it's going to prefer to go right. Uh, now, of course, it is possible to manifest this behavior without calculation of action value. Right? There are algorithms that can explain operant learning, that can explain decision making, that do not uh, pose this calculation of action value. So the fact that we find this choice representation uh, does not imply that there is action value calculation. Uh, but if we take uh, these nerves that represent choice in the action value framework, uh, these nerves will correlate with both action values with opposite signs. Uh, why? Let's say I have a node that represents the choice of going left, uh, and I look here at action value left, while well, action value right remains constant, and I change it from 10% to 50% to 90%, of course the probability of choosing left will increase. So choice no one will be uh, positively correlated with action value left, and also, when I increase the action value right from 10% to 50% to 90%, probability of choosing left will decrease. So the choice neuron will be correlated with action, will, will be negatively correlated with action value right. So it will correlate with both action values with opposite signs. Uh, and this is what we get. Uh, if we look, if we do the regression, we will expect the choice neuron to be somewhere in uh, this marked area, okay? or the area that we will call delta Q. 
So detection of delta kilonewtons uh, is not evident for action value calculation. Um, but it turns out the problem is even worse uh, because when we talk about uh, representations, uh, we almost always uh, say that these representations are noisy. Right? So let's say a number represents choice. Uh, so it, uh, um, it's finally it's some linear transformation of choice plus Poisson noise. And let's say the noise is very, very low, so we expect to find uh, the, the result of the regression on this neuron somewhere over here. And if I increase the Poisson noise a little bit, I will find the neuron maybe over here. Uh, so if I have low noise levels, uh, I will classify my choice neuron indeed as a choice neuron. But what happens when I increase the noise, I might actually find my choice neuron over here or over here. Um, and then I will classify it as a, an action value neuron. And if I increase uh, the noise, even, noise levels even more, I will get a neuron that is classified as not significant. So basically, the way that we classify our neurons simply depends on the level of noise. And we also wanted to show this uh, for the population analysis. Uh, so we simply simulated a direct policy learning model. I'm not really going to go, you can see the model here. I don't really want to go into it. I just, want, I just put it here to convince you that there is no representation of action value in the learning process. Okay? So basically, uh, when we talk about direct policy, the probability of choice uh, changes directly as a function of uh, choices and rewards. Here, if I chose left and got, uh, and got a reward, the probability of choosing left will increase. And if I chose, uh, uh, so if I chose two and I didn't get a reward, the probability of choosing uh, one will uh, even increase, uh, will also increase. And if I chose one and I didn't get a reward, the probability of choosing one will decrease. Uh, and if I choose two and I uh, got a reward, the probability of choosing one will decrease. So very, very simple model. Uh, we can also see that it learns. Uh, there is no representation of action value here. But of course, we can still do the same analysis. What do we do? We estimate action values from the history of choices and rewards. Um, and uh, we take a neuron that represents the choices, meaning whether uh, uh, the algorithm chose to go right or left. Uh, and then we, we simply regress uh, the spike count of these neurons and these estimated action values. And these are the results that we get. Right? So not only is it the case that choice neurons, uh, that, that we do get a classification of choice neurons as action value neurons, uh, but the vast majority of these neurons are classified as representing action value. And you can see this here uh, for uh, two different levels of noise. Uh, and uh, here we, it even seems as if there is barely any representation of choice or the difference between action values. Um, okay, so why is it so easy uh, to find these action values in choice neurons? Uh, and the, the answer is in the analysis, because we, I, I said in the beginning that when we talk about representation of action value, we say that we want a neuron that represents one action value but not the other. But when we go ahead and do the analysis, we classify it is enough for us to classify a neuron as an action value neuron if it has a significant regression coefficient with one action value but not with the other. But clearly, the fact that there is no significant regression coefficient uh, with one action value uh, does not indicate that there is no correlation, right? Th this is th simply a matter of the power of the analysis. So we make it very, very easy for neurons to be classified as action value neurons when they, in fact, they are correlated also with the second action value. Uh, and these analyses are very permissive considering the support for action value representation requires a null result. Uh, so I, until now, I talked about the statistical issues. Uh, here, what happens when we deal with noise or with slow modulation? Uh, but actually, I think uh, that there is even a deeper conceptual question here that is not related to the level of noise um, in the data. So we want to ask when we talk about action value, yes or no, what type of representation should we consider as action value representation? So clearly, a neuron that represents one action value, uh, we will consider an action value neuron. But what if it represents action value one minus one tenth of action value two, action value one, 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 one half of action value two, or simply the difference between them. So basically the analysis today, they try to draw a line somewhere here between the first and the last option. But it, it's not entirely clear that this dichotomy actually makes sense uh, and that answering the question, there is or isn't representation of action value is, is a question that informs us in any way about what is going on in the brain. Uh, so to sum up why we should reconsider the evidence for action value representation, uh, we conducted a literature search. Uh, all found papers either report delta and action value representation together, 
meaning they don't even try to differentiate choice and action value, or they are subject to the slow modulations concern I talked about at the beginning. Uh, and this, in fact, is an opportunity to reconsider how we analyze our data. So again, I use the same gym as I'll figure just because they, they are the only ones who provide such a detailed figure. Uh, so when we look at the data, we want to ask ourselves, uh, is this uh, red, uh, uh, sorry, is this uh, green square here actually qualitatively different from the blue circle right here, right? So we draw these lines and we say that these are different neurons that have different representations. Um, but actually, if we want to say something about this cloud of data that we have here, uh, I would say it makes more sense to do clustering analysis and to use explained variance in the data um, than to do the significance test to draw these hard boundaries um, between the data points. Uh, also, uh, so far action value has had little competition. Uh, this means that basically in the analysis that we're done, uh, anything that is not stationary firing rate is very likely detected as action value. Uh, I think there is a reason for this. I mean, action value is a very attractive uh, theory. It's very, e you, you can find, you can uh, find the variables that you want to regress the neural activity on quite easily, and there aren't any uh, decision-making theories that are uh, <coughs> quite as easy to, to find the neural correlates for. Uh, but despite this fact, uh, there are many alternatives that should be considered. Um, slow modulations is one, uh, other decision-making algorithms, uh, despite the fact that they are uh, more complex, and uh, perhaps uh, some combination between representation of action value and other representations. Uh, so to summarize, uh, seemingly, there is overwhelming evidence for action value representation in the striatum. Uh, all the evidence we have found is, is subject to at least uh, one of two consonants. Uh, the vast majority are subject to both. Uh, slow modulations appear as action value representation. Uh, so it is enough for a neuron to be slowly modulated for it to be classified as representing action value. And choice also appears as action value representation. Uh, and finally, there are alternative approaches to the data that are not subject to these consonants. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the labs that have kindly provided us uh, with their data. Uh, Oren Peles, Elon Vaadia, Uri Werner-Reis from the Vaadia Lab, uh, Pshara Awad, Itai Hershen Horen, Israel Nelken from the Nelken Lab, and Kenji Doyen, Makoto Eitzel from Doya Lab. Uh, I would also like to thank my supervisor, Jonathan Lowenstein, uh, and the agencies that have funded this research, uh, Israel Science Foundation, GASB, and CLC 1080. Uh, and that's it. Thank you.